Welcome to this third presentation about following the student to electric vehicles. In this presentation, I will discuss the accelerator pedal position sensor subsystems and how the safety critical rules relate to it. Although primarily intended for EV teams, this presentation could be of interest to teams implementing electronic throttle control and those interested in signal validation techniques for SCS systems. However, it is not a comprehensive presentation about SCS. I am only touching on this subject. This presentation is intended for new teams, students or scrutineers who are familiarising themselves with the EV rules. This is not a how-to video. I'm not going to tell you how to design your car, but I will point out the key rules that you need to comply with and suggest pitfalls that you should avoid. First, an introduction. My name is Craig Powers. I am a control systems engineer in the power generation industry. Motorsport is just a hobby and I have my own single seat race car. I've been volunteering at Formula Student since 2003 in many roles, including in Germany and Russia, and I have been an EV scrutineer for the last six years. I had some immediate feedback on version one of the presentation that I had based it solely on using potentiometers for the apps. This was because I wanted to keep the safety critical signals examples simple. I must point out that there are alternative types of linear and angular displacement transducers and encoders available, for example, rotary hall effect sensors. So when viewing this presentation, please bear this in mind. I am not suggesting that you use potentiometers they were an obvious way of describing signal behaviour to help illustrate safety critical signals. A word of warning. The apps has safety critical signals and the safety critical signal rules are quite an advanced topic. So read the rules thoroughly. Make sure that you analyse your system design for all possible failure modes and explain your app subsystem well in the FMEA and the ESF. It will help the scrutineers to review your design and that could make all the difference of passing scrutineering. If you are attending the UK competition, then read the Formula Student UK supplementary rules. The UK rules require you to perform a comprehensive analysis of your system using an FMEA. Do this, it will help inform and refine your design. So let's put this in context. The APS is the accelerator pedal position sensor, typically a potentiometer, and there are a minimum of two in the system. Shown is a typical system with two APS monitored by a controller, the ECU, which sets a torque demand to an inverter or motor controller feeding a drivetrain motor. So let's look at the 2020 apps rules. The first few rules are about the mechanical arrangement. It needs to be operated by a foot pedal. The range of travel is defined as 0 to 100%. The foot pedal must return to the zero position when not actuated. You've got to have a positive stop to prevent any damage to the apps. And you need two throttle springs to pull the pedal back to the zero position. Now moving on to the electrical rules, there's got to be at least two sensors and they should have different non-intersecting transfer functions and we'll be discussing this in more detail later. And the app system is defined as safety critical. The rules tell us about what to do if there is an implausibility between the values of the apps, that the power to the motors must be shut down completely, but it is not necessary to open the shutdown circuit. And this suggests that this can be carried out as a software based function within a controller such as the ECU. Implausibility is also defined as being more than 10 percentage point difference between apps values. And further rules tell us how we should physically arrange the wiring to allow for testing and what should happen if the accelerator pedal is released. We should have a zero wheel torque. This is safe. Now we come to the safety critical signals rules. It's quite obvious that the apps is going to be safety critical because it influences wheel torque. 
The SCS rules tell us that we must be able to detect certain classes of signal failures, open circuit faults, short circuits to ground, short circuit to supply voltage. Also, any implausibility due to out of range signals, things which are mechanically impossible. Also covered are rules for digitally transmitted signals, which may also apply to your system. I'm going to start with a flawed design to illustrate the weaknesses of that design and how we can make something better. Now, first of all, I want to point out that this app system does not satisfy the rule about having non-intersecting transfer functions. In this example, the transfer functions are identical. Now, that's a glaring mistake, but it's not relevant to what I'm going to show you, so bear with me. Where I am taking you is a discussion about implementing safety critical signals and systems that are defensive to signal faults. This particular apps is constructed with zero pedal position equaling the end of the potentiometer travel. So the potentiometer returns zero volts at zero pedal position. Imagine that the car has passed scrutineering and part way through the first dynamics day, we develop an open circuit fault on apps B due to a broken wire. There is no power to the potentiometer, so the apps B signal remains at zero volts. The team take the car to the acceleration event. The driver lines up on the start line and floors the accelerator pedal. Apps A responds, but apps B stays at zero volts due to the broken connection. The apps detects a 10% discrepancy between the two values and the car requests zero torque demand due to the plausibility check. The car coasts to a halt. The team fail the dynamic event. They get no points and they have no idea what went wrong and they are now under pressure to find that problem. Wouldn't it be better if they had advance warning of the problem so that they could fix the problem before they went to the accelerator event start line. I will now introduce the concept of a live zero signal, i.e. one where the sensor returns a non-zero value when the system is powered up, but in the dormant or zero state. We use this technique in many industries. Now, if we suffer the same fault, a break in the apps B power supply line, the signal falls immediately to zero volts and the ECU can detect the out of range value and flag up a signal fault. If the signal failure is detectable uh, and displayable via an indicator or screen message, then the team can see the fault as soon as they power up the LV. They'll know about the fault before they go to the dynamic event, can fix it and therefore they won't lose the points. So we've used the concept of live zero signals to allow the system to detect an open circuit or power supply fault. We've now got improved diagnostics. We are able to diagnose and fix faults in advance. And therefore we've got improved availability of the protective functions and of the race car itself. So let's look at the common failures that occur. First of all, loss of power. Well, we've just looked at that. If we get loss of power, then there is no current flow through the sensor or through the potentiometer in the case of the apps. The scanner input will be pulled low down to zero volts by the ground connection. And the scanner, the ECU, can detect the fault by analog low threshold checks. In this scenario, we have a break in the connection down to zero volts or down to ground. Again, there's no current flow through the sensor. But in this case, the scanner input is pulled high by the supply voltage. Again, the scanner can detect the fault by an analog voltage check, a high threshold. Now we have a break in the signal connection between the sensor, the potentiometer, and the scanner, the ECU. Now this one's slightly more complicated because it really depends on how the scanner input behaves. But chances are it will probably be pulled low down to zero volts by its own internal resistance of the scanner circuit, the signal conditioning circuit. If so, then the scanner
scanner can detect a fault again by an analog low threshold check. We now have a simple tool at our disposal to help deal with safety critical signals. Live zero inputs help us with open circuit faults or loss of power. The input signal will fail low and can be detected by a simple voltage threshold check. So for example, if our signal is half a volt to four and a half volts for 0 to 100% scaled value, then we can check for a low signal less than a quarter of a volt and we can check for a high signal greater than 4.75 volts and anything outside of the range is a bad signal. Now these are just example values so please don't copy these into your design I'm just using them for illustration purposes. This shows for a single channel what I've just been talking about about signal validation with low and high analog threshold checks. The orange region is slightly out of range but not so much that we would want to consider it a fault so this allows for minor calibration errors now a word of caution if you allow your signals to be extrapolated outside of the 0 to 100 percent range let's say minus two percent when the pedal is not depressed please make sure that your software can cope with these out of range values in this case, slightly negative. So the previous slides were about signal validation in the general sense to help us implement SCS systems. But as I mentioned at the start, the example APS was non-compliant with the rules because it had two identical transfer functions and that's not allowed. Two different transfer functions must be used for the two apps. The reason is that we want to be able to detect a problem if the two app signal lines short together, in which case the monitoring circuit, e.g. the ECU, will receive two identi identical signal voltages. Now, if the transfer functions were the same, then they would both return the same scaled value in percent, and the implausibility check would not work. But if we use different transfer functions, and they are sufficiently different that the two scaling systems return more than 10% discrepancy, then we will be able to diagnose the fault of the two signals becoming connected together. So I just want to compare the rules uh, between 2019 and 2020. In 2019, positive slopes were specified, but that has been removed in 2020, and now they just need to be non-intersecting. Now, the only way that two lines can be non-intersecting is to have the same slope. But I don't think that this rule is forcing us to adopt the same slopes for the two apps transfer functions. My interpretation is that the two transfer functions should not intersect within the valid range of pedal travel, i.e. within the 0 to 100% range. But I do stress that this is my interpretation of the rules. So let's look at the two ways of implementing non-intersecting apps transfer functions. Well, the first method is to have them parallel, but with different offsets. Offset, another name for that is the intercept, which is the value where the line crosses the y-axis. It's important that the two transfer functions need to return greater than 10% discrepancy if they are subjected to the same input voltage. So this means that the two intercepts need to be more than 10% apart. So this is option two, which is different slopes, but intersecting outside of the normal pedal range. Again, we need two lines to be separated by at least 10% in the Y direction across the entire valid pedal range. So that if we get a short circuit between the two app signal lines, then the transfer functions will result in a greater than 10% discrepancy, thereby triggering the plausibility check. Two dissimilar transfer functions like this 
are achieved by different slope and offsets. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that just using two different potentiometer values, e.g. a 10k pot and a 15k pot, will give different transfer functions. It won't, because they are just potential dividers. Instead of looking at graphs, let's look at what this means in the physical arrangement. So how do we offset two potentiometers for use by the apps? Well, the first method is to physically offset the two pots by starting their zero position at different angles. So this changes the offsets, but it doesn't change the slopes. And it would result in the parallel lines example that I gave before. Another method is to add biasing resistors in one or more of the app's potential divider circuits. By adjustment of the biasing resistor and or the potentiometer scale, this will give differing offset and slope. Another method is to use potentiometers with different physical travel. Most apps potentiometers tend to be the rotary type. So let's say if we used a 90 degree pot and a 270 degree pot of the same resistance value, then this would result in different transfer functions. You can implement non-intersecting apps transfer functions using a variety of means and a combination of means. You can physically offset the potentiometers at different starting positions. You can use potentiometers with different angular ranges. You can use potentiometers with different resistance ranges. You can fit biasing or offset resistors on the high side or the low side of the apps on both of them or just one. Or you could even use different supply voltage for each app circuit. The rules do allow more than two apps, but you'll need to derive a suitable algorithm for comparing and selecting signals, e.g. a two out of three algorithm. So what should you do before you turn up for scrutineering? Your system must have separate connectors for each apps so they can be individually disconnected during scrutineering functional tests. You should perform tests on your system to make sure that they can detect the common failures that I've described, and you should perform actual functional tests on each apps. Check for open circuit. Check for loss of apps power supply. Make sure that you don't have any common mode failures that could affect both apps. Ensure that all faults are handled safely and result in zero torque demand. And if you've got any data logging or display systems or fault lights, make sure that signal faults are correctly enunciated. And I must say that data logging may be very, very helpful if you have an intermittent fault. So the common mistakes with the apps that we see at the UK competition. Not following the safety critical systems rules so that signal faults are not detectable. Some teams omit the 10% implausibility check altogether. Some teams don't have differing transfer functions. Some teams have shared supply lines or fusing for the two apps. A regular problem we find at scrutineering is apps that do not have separate detachable connections for testing. And we regularly see untidy wiring and poor implementation because it's down in the bottom of the tub and is not visible. A little extra hint. You also need to implement an implausibility between the apps and the brake pedal. So bear this in mind when you decide your architecture because all of those signals need to be available to the logic that does that. As soon as I published version one, I received a question about the independence of the apps, in particular the power supplies. How independent should they be? There are obviously limits to how independent you can make the app circuits. After all, you likely have just one LV battery and one app scanner, e.g. an ECU. So there are, in, are inevitably common mode failures that will affect both apps. My advice is based on the Alara principle or sometimes called a LARP, to reduce the risk to be as low as reasonably achievable. So you should go to reasonable lengths 
to avoid common mode failure scenarios. Have separate power supply lines and fusing to the two apps. Perhaps route the app's signals and power via different diverse routes to avoid a single event damaging both channels. The most important thing is that you understand the possible failure modes, you've analysed them, and that you ensure that a fault on one or more apps is detectable and will safely shut down the talk to the motors. You should use the FMEA to guide you. So, in summary, we've discussed the apps rules both for 2019 and 2020. We've discussed the safety critical signals rules and how they relate to the apps subsystem. We've discussed techniques such as live zero signals and analog threshold signal validation to help detect failures, to help us implement those safety critical systems rules. And we've discussed the need for differing transfer functions for the apps. And we've discussed some common mistakes. So I would like to thank you for listening. I would like to stress that this is my own work. It's not official or sanctioned by any of the Formula Student or SAE organisations or competitions. I've provided my email address and would welcome any feedback or discussion, but I cannot answer any specific questions about your car and its entry to a Formula Student or SAE competition. I cannot answer any eligibility questions. So. I would urge you to use the formal mechanism, which in the case of the UK is the Formula Student Question Database. Thank you very much.